Well, howdy, Tri-State. Uh, I have some sobering news. Um, Halloween is officially over. Um, the Mummers Parade happened last night, um, so now we're just, you know, full, full sprint towards Christmas, right? Because um, once, once the Mummers Parade has actually come through downtown Hagerstown, you know, littering Potomac Street with all the flotsam and jetsam our fair city has to offer, um, I mean, we, we are pretty much done with fall as we know it. Um, I, I'm, I'm kidding. Most of you have been pointing out this morning that you've got like trick or treating like still ahead of you in your various neighborhoods, including including Hagerstown, where I'm I'm pretty convinced that, that like the neighborhood where I live, like like Halloween is bigger than Christmas, like just by the sheer number of, of decorations and fake spider webs I see on everyone's porch um, at this time of year. And the funny thing is that even though Halloween does not rival Christmas. Um, we're still really into Halloween as a culture, in like a really weird kind of way. Like I read an article in The Economist this past week that said that, that um, Americans at Halloween time spend $350 million just on costumes for their pets. <laughs> I mean, never mind the psychological issues of those who dress up their dogs as people. What about those who dress their dogs up like, like other kinds of, of things? Like, hey, my dog is a butter. Your dog is already a dog. Like, you can, you can roll over, play fetch, play poker. What else do you want your dog to do? I mean, we really have this bizarre obsession with, with sort of like this horror theme and dressing up in costume. So much so that there is actually a haunted house in California um, they, they let two people in at a time, at, at two people max at a time, sometimes just you by yourself, um, and, and the entire like, experience lasts up to eight hours, but no one has ever made it all the way through. It's 21 or older, you have to sign a waiver, and, and rather than just being merely like, like the usual haunted like corn maze that like we have around here, like they will tie you to chairs, they will undress you, they will make you eat disgusting things. And here's the thing, the people who run this, like they don't charge anything. They're just doing it for the experience. Would you believe that there are 17,000 people on the wait list to get into this thing? There's something really bizarre, I think, about that, that, that transcends the, the, the ordinary just fascination with, with horror themes and things like that. And, and when, when science fiction writer um, Ray Bradbury passed away, um, Lev Grossman, a, a book critic for Time Magazine, wrote this really great piece in Time um, talking about the way that we, as a, as a society, tend to look for um, bad places. Like, like the whole subgenre of fiction that's out right now is called dystopian fiction, from the word dystopia, meaning bad place. So if you're a fan of things like, like um, the Hunger Games series, or uh, what's the other one, the Divergent, right? Um, if you're a fan of those kinds of books, what's, what's the appeal of, of being fascinated with, with those types of stories of, of governmental oppression and fighting back against the powers? What's the appeal of that? What's the appeal of things like The Walking Dead? What's the appeal of horror in general? And, and Grossman says the reason that we are so fascinated with these bad stories is because each of us inhabits a bad place of, our, in our, of ourselves. Like, we all are inhabiting a place that we don't really know and we don't really can call home. And so as a result, we need to find ways to cope. And the best way we can find to cope is by just experiencing those things in a transfigured form. Like, I can't cope with, you know, my, like my boss or my relationships, but I can cope with the zombies on TV. Like, we, we use fiction, we use stories to try and understand our world. Now listen, that, that also tells us something really meaningful. It, it tells us that our world is in such a way that many people in our society feel as if they are living in a bad place. They, they feel as if they are not living the, the way that they had been intended to live. That, that when we look at our story of David here in just a moment, what we're seeing is that, okay, now, now David had been anointed king over Israel, but Saul is still reigning. 
And, and David's popularity had soared after the slaying of Goliath to such an extent that Saul is now violently angry at David and anyone on his side. So David's only recourse is to flee, and so for the next 10 years of David's life, he flees into the wilderness and has to experience all the suffering that comes from having your life be completely unestablished. And so most of us in this room live lives where occasionally we find ourselves in the wilderness. We find ourselves in unfamiliar terrain, and we find ourselves lacking the happiness, the security, even the physical health that we believe that we are entitled to, and we don't know how God fits into that. So when we, we see passages like this, we, we recognize that David lived in a world where, where suffering just happened often. And, and, and our world is no different. So if you, if you have your Bibles um, or your smartphone, turn quickly to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel 25. And, and what's happening here in this overall section is we're kind of seeing like, like three, three stories um, kind of sandwiched together. Okay, so in 1 Samuel 24, what we see happening is, is that Samuel is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, David is out in the wilderness, um, and, and he and his men um, have an opportunity to kill Saul. Like, like David's enemy can be put out. Like, like David can, can take care of all his problems right now. And, and what he does is he cuts, cuts off a, a piece of Saul's robe. He gets close enough to do that, um, but, but he spares his life. And, and later he actually waves that piece of the robe at Saul and says, listen, I had the opportunity, I did not take it. And, and, for, and for a brief moment, Saul seems to, to have forgotten his, his vendetta against David. In chapter 26, the one after 25, chapter 26, we see, we see Saul and David encounter yet again. And once again, David spares Saul's life. But in sandwiched between these two stories is chapter 25, where we see David like living out this larger story um, where he encounter, encounters a, a, another corrupt leader. So we'll, we'll just look at um, 1 Samuel 25. Um, the first thing we see happens is this. It says, Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. Then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. So at this point, David's, like, mentor has, has now passed away. Like, like, David's human guide, like, his human moral conscience is now gone. That's kind of the, the, the setup to this whole story. Verse 2 says, There was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich, 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm, and they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. See, what had been happening, apparently, is that David and his men, which, which are numerous at this point, um, had actually been kind of serving as sort of like this neighborhood watch group. And they'd basically been, been taking care of the, of the servants of this region. And so David's saying, listen, since we did this stuff for you, would you extend to us the same courtesy and, and just, you know, serve us um, in, in any way you possibly can? Verse 9 says this. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. And Nabal, the, the, the leader here, the businessman, he said, Nabal answered David's servants, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. He knew who David was. I mean, David had an enormous reputation. So the question he's asking is here is not really identity. It's, it's more like, who is this guy? Who does he think he is to ask any favor from me whatsoever? 
Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men who come from, who, from I do not know where? So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword. And every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. So the first thing that we see is that when we live in a wilderness, the wilderness reveals, it exposes our idols. I mean, the wilderness exposes our idols. Now, most of us are not going to strap on a sword or a gun and, and try to take care of our problems that way. But, but we all have our own means of coping with, with stress. Like David felt as if his rights had now been violated. And the only way to, to solve that was to make sure that he could assert his rights and put things back the way he wanted them to be. And, and, and when, when we live in our own wilderness, we often have to find ways to take care of ourselves the way that we feel that we deserve to be treated. I mean, there's several different ways we can do that. Like, if, if things aren't going well um, in terms of, like, your employment um, and, and working really hard isn't necessarily going well for you, you're starting getting the promotion you deserve or the, the respect you want, um, it's really tempting um, to start looking for other ways to find value and find fulfillment. Same way in your marriage. If your spouse no longer um, seems to be honoring you the way you feel you deserve or respecting you the way you feel you deserve, you will find other ways to find fulfillment. And, and the problem, of course, is that when we look for those other ways, we tend to look for less acceptable things. And so the reason that we become so lost, the reason we become so addicted to things like pornography, um, the, the reason we become so invested in our careers to an unhealthy degree, the reason that we become invested in our hobbies to an unhealthy degree is because we look to those things for our sense of security, well-being, and satisfaction, and those things can never satisfy you. And, and we know that. It's just that those things tend to be easier than having to endure the longer wait of living in a wilderness situation and waiting for God to come through. And, and the real problem, of course, is that even if things were going well, even if your career was on track, even if you had a picture-perfect marriage, none of those things in and of themselves is enough to sustain you for the long haul. Like, like only God and his promises and the things that he has achieved for you and for us is enough to really sustain you and give you a sense of purpose and joy and identity. We'll come back to that. So what happens then is that, that uh, well, we'll jump down to verse 14. One of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm, and we did not miss anything when we were in the fields as long as we were with him. They were a wall to us both by night and by day, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore know this and consider what you should do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his house, and he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took two hundred loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared and five seahs of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and two hundred cakes of figs and laid them on donkeys." She said to her young men, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. And as she rode on the donkey and came down under the cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David and all, more also if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. So you know what's going on, right? I mean, Abigail is now worried about the bloodshed that will ensue if David carries his plan through. So, so in, a, in, a, in a sort of not so subtle way, she, she kind of bribes him a little bit. Like she, she basically puts together like this elaborate fruit basket, okay, to, to distribute to all of David's men as sort of a, a peace offering, maybe is a better word than bribe. To say, listen, we, we don't have to go this route. 
but verse 23 says, When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. She's making a really good play on words, because the Hebrew word for Nabal is very similar to the word for fool. So she's saying that, listen, the, the guy is a fool. Like, fool is his name, because folly is with him. I've already lost my place, I'm sorry. 25, thank you. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil shall not be found in you as long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you, seek your life. The life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God, and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. When the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs or conscience for having shed blood without cause or my Lord working salvation for himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. So Abigail just kind of pours her heart out before David. Like this is the last recourse. Like she is now on her knees pleading for the life of Nabal, even though Nabal doesn't really deserve it. Like, she's still doing this anyway. She brings the gift. She, she surrenders herself right there before this guy who has the power to just decimate her family and bring ruin to the whole region. And, and here's the really interesting thing, is that he, as, as, as just tough and determined as David is, his heart instantly softens when he sees this whole scene unfold before him. It says that David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt, from working salvation with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by morning there had been not one left, not been left in Nabal so much as one male, David received from her what she had brought him, and he said to her, Go up in peace to your house. I have obeyed your voice, and I have granted your petition. So the second thing we see in the context of this story is that, that beauty expands our vision. Like the only thing we really know about Abigail besides her courage is her beauty. And, and Christianity has this long tradition, just stemming all the way back to like the ancient like Eastern fathers, that when we see beauty in the world, it, 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 it's not beauty unto itself, but it's beauty that reflects the beauty of God. So when we see and we, we feel something beautiful, we're seeing something of God. We're seeing his kingdom starting to break into the, the prison that we, that we inhabit. Like one of my favorite movies is, of course, The Shawshank Redemption, um, a, a really tough um, harsh look at, at life uh, in an unfair prison where, where, where Andy Dufresne is in prison for a crime he doesn't commit. And, and there he befriends and kind of rises to the, 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 the top of the prison ladder, so to speak, um, even though he's still in prison. And, and what happens in the course of the film is he's, he's given permission to start this prison library. And so all, all these different organizations are sending them materials for their library, books, uh, records, etc. And so when he gets this first shipment in, he's there in the main prison office, uh, and they leave him alone temporarily. So he, he shuts the guard in the, in the bathroom and locks the door. He locks the door to the office. He, he picks out one of the opera records, and he puts it on the player, and he puts the needle on. And then he takes the prison intercom system, and he holds the intercom system up to the speaker of, of the record player so that all throughout Shawshank Prison, everyone turns their heads and listens to, to the sound of the, this opera record, singing only in Italian 
and, and they just attenuate their, their focus and their, their attention to this, this beautiful music. And, and, and um, Andy's friend Red, he says this by way of narration. So you have to picture like Morgan Freeman's voice here. He says this, he says, I have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. Some things are best left unsaid. I'd like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words. It makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you, those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a gray place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made those walls dissolve away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man in Shawshank felt free. There's something that really just captures our imagination and our attention by beauty, whether it's in art, whether it's in music, whether it's in nature. And, and when, we, when we see that, when we allow God to use that to turn our focus away from self and away from the salvation that we bring for ourselves, then we, we expand our vision so that we can actually see what God wants to do for his people throughout all human history. That, that suffering is not merely just a, an interruption in God's plan, but that suffering might be a part of God's plan. Like, we, we forget that all the time. And, and what happens is that when you go through a really rough patch, you, you have this endless supply of people who come into your life to, to offer you this graceless, Christless, anti-Christian advice. Like if you, if you go through a bad breakup or if you go through a job loss, people will come along and say, well, God, God never closes a door without opening a window or, or there are more fish in the sea and just, you know, be patient and trust in God's timing. And while, while there might be some grains of truth to all of those things, the, the, the issue is not if I be good during this test, then God will reward me with joy in the end. No, no, no. The, the issue is that we, we are in this test. We are in this wilderness, and God is with us in this wilderness. That, that God actually wants to use the circumstances in our lives to maximize our joy. Not that we be really good and get through it, then he rewards us. No, no, no. God is our reward, even in the midst of these storms. Verse 36, Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. Nabal's heart was merry within him. He was very drunk. She told him nothing at all until the morning light. In the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things. His heart died within him, and he became as a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. See, David didn't, didn't have to do it himself. He could trust in God's timing to eliminate the threat that was before him. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to you to take you to him as his wife. And she rose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey, and her five young women attended her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. We'll, we'll deal in a future sermon with, with David and his multiple wives at this point. Um, but what we definitely see now is that, you know, all the way back in verse 39, we see that, that David's response to what God has done is to say that blessed be the Lord. Like, like our, our final point is that, that worship expresses our trust. Like, like we can worship so many things. Like we can worship um, sex. We can worship our career. We can worship relationships. But if we, if we turn our worship and our love to God, then we, we are expressing our trust and our confidence that, that God will come through even, even when our world is turned upside, upside down. And, and some of you are, are living lives right now where you are experiencing a wilderness. And, and you're, you keep thinking to yourself, listen, I, I would be more involved in the things of God. I would be more involved in, in ministry. I would be more involved if I could, if I could just get through this season of my life. Because some of you in here, you've, you've got careers that are eating you alive. 
Uh, you, you've got marriages that are, are really difficult. You, I mean, some of you have, have like either like newborn babies or babies on the way, um, and that's a really rough season of your life. And, and, and it's really tempting in those seasons to think, listen, if I can just get through this, if I can just get through the next trimester, or if I can just get through the first year, or I can just get through the next you know, busy season at work, that then I can really focus on, on what God has for me. But maybe what God has for us is exactly those seasons. Maybe what God has for us is exactly those struggles so that we can learn more deeply what it means to trust him and praise him in the midst of all of this. I mean, David went through this for 10 years. 10 years. A friend of mine says that there is nothing more exhausting than being unestablished. I mean, it is, it is rough to know that you are not where you think you ought to be. It has to be even rougher for a guy like David who knows from God what his destiny is and has yet to actually taste it. But, but, but here, here's what happens. Here's what happens in the course of human history. It, we, we find eventually in the gospel accounts a, a true and better David in the person of Jesus. And one of the first things that Jesus does in his, in his adult life is he enters the wilderness. In, in Mark's version of that story, he says that he actually goes out and there were wild animals around him. That, that even as Adam was first in the garden where he named the animals, now Jesus, the new Adam, is now in the wilderness where he is surrounded by a creation torn asunder by human sin. And, and in the other gospel accounts, we see that, that Satan in some mysterious way, appears to him after 40 days of fasting and says, listen, um, make these stones become bread, okay? Like he takes them to the top of the, of the mountain. He shows, them, he shows Jesus everything that's there in Jerusalem and says, listen, all of this can be yours if you bow down and worship me. And there's something really significant about that because Jesus knows that his destiny is going to be painful, it's going to be bloody, it's going to be awful. It would be really tempting for Jesus to say, listen, I, I give up. Let's just do this now. Like, I, we'll, just, we'll just go ahead and just fix this right now. I don't have to die. I don't have to go to the cross. I don't have to do any of those things. But each time that Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus said no. That even though Adam, the first Adam in the Garden of Eden, was tempted and lost, Jesus was tempted in, the, in the, this wilderness, and he succeeded. And so Jesus, Jesus is our, our true and better Adam. He's our true and better David. He's the one that passes all of our wilderness tests. And because he does that, that, that his righteousness is credited then to our account. That when God looks at us, even in the midst of our suffering, he doesn't see people who make really bad choices. He sees Jesus who has passed every test. So, so our, our confidence doesn't come from being really good and making it through Our confidence comes from knowing that God is in control and has sovereign control over every circumstance. That that our worship truly does express our trust and our confidence in God and in Jesus rather than all the foolish, worthless idols of our our world. So so when we go to these tables that are around the room in just a moment, we're, we're going there not because church is an interruption in our schedule or, or a pit stop to get some energy. No, no, church, church becomes an expression of trust just as much as, every, just like everything in life is an expression of trust, or every form of worship, rather, is an expression of trust in God. See, when we come to these tables, we're celebrating the, the death of one who, who went to the wilderness, he went to the cross, so that you and I could, would, would not have to suffer alone that, that Jesus went through and he experienced all the wilderness temptations that you and I constantly go through. And he achieved victory over sin, over death, that, that you and I would not have to experience failure. Now, the worship band's going to come in, in a moment, and uh, we'll, we'll um, go to the tables in, in, in a second. The, the challenge that's before all of us is to no longer see suffering or to see God as, as merely giving us tests to see how good we are. Uh, the, the challenge is, is to, in the middle of those, of those circumstances, to see how good God is. That, that we don't have to narrow our vision that we see 
only what's before us, but we recognize that God is always constantly, relentlessly at work. And we can follow David's example of just being ferociously committed to God's overarching plan. I'll leave you with this. Uh, when I was a, a student um, in, in, in undergraduate uh, studies, I was, a, I was a science major, and, and when, you're, when you're in gen chem, like you do lots of, of weird labs where basically you just mix things together and see what happens. It's super boring, but you gotta go through it. And, and my professor was like this really old guy, really, I mean, terrific man, um, who used to lament the way that students would often like mix these things together, uh, and th then they would come up to him and be like, listen, I'm, like, like what's supposed to be happening in here? And, and the reason is because it, it never looks like the way the pictures look in the textbook. Uh, it never even looks the way that the teacher like did it be when he like did it before class. Like it, it always looks different than what you expect. And he gave this advice. He says, "Don't ask what's supposed to be happening, because something is happening. Ask what is happening inside that test tube." Like we will always live lives where we, we are expected to know like what's supposed to be happening in my life. Like no matter what age you're at, like there's some circumstance that, that is before you where people are gonna come to you and say, well, you're supposed to be at this career level where you're supposed to have more kids or you're supposed to have a, a, a good marriage or you're supposed to be at some particular like social standard. It, okay, don't, don't look at what's supposed to be happening. Look at what is happening in your life and the way God uses that. I mean, most of you know that this is like my second career. Like, I didn't, I didn't like grow up wanting to be a preacher. Like, I, I what, what happened with me is that after four years of, of undergrad, um, I mean, I was, I was reasonably successful. Like, I got, I got a degree in biochemistry. I ended up working at Fort Detrick, Maryland. I, I worked for the USDA doing research. Um, after my, my, my government um, funding ran up, I, I transferred to National Cancer Institute where I did autopsies or laboratory mice. And that did not go well for me. Okay, after four months of getting yelled at for butcher, literally butchering these mice, some of which were like $1,000 of research apiece, I did the, the healthy, mature thing. I, I locked myself in the government bathroom and just cried my eyes out. Because at that time, I was, I was looking towards like future education, possibly transferring to getting some kind of master's program, and, and I realized that if this goes south for me, that's it. And, and what will happen for everyone in this room is there will be times in your life when you face that wilderness, when everything falls apart, and you don't know how God's going to come through for you. And in that moment, I definitely did not know how God was going to come through for me. I mean, I drove off that, that, that uh, research base that day, never came back. I mean, it was months. I mean, it was months before I finally figured out that maybe, like, the whole leading Bible study thing should become, like, go from being my, my side project to my day job. Okay, that, now, not all of you in here need to go to seminary. Some of you may be. I don't know. But, but we will all experience those times in our life when we have those wilderness moments where we've got to figure out what is, it that's God, what is it that God's fundamentally doing and how can I worship, trust, and obey him even in the midst of those wilderness moments. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for David for his example of what it means to have trust in you even in the midst of wilderness moments. Lord, we, we ask that as we go to these tables, that we recognize the victory you've achieved for us, the example you've set for us, that when we take these elements, we're saying thank you, and we're also coming to, to you this morning just saying that we don't have it figured out. Like if I take this bread and this cup, it's me saying I, I can't do it on my own. Like I don't have the answers, I, I don't think I ever can. But Jesus is my answer. And so, Lord, I pray that, that for all of us in this room, we go to these tables, we take these elements with gladness and joy, independent of the circumstance we find ourselves in. And we thank you for that example. We thank you for that sacrifice, that, that no matter how dark our wilderness is today, that there is a brighter hope ahead of us in the resurrection from the dead. So we pray, Lord, that we would have just the courage to follow you and worship you even in the midst of all of these things. It's in your son's name we pray these things and by the power of your spirit, amen.